Bible's open there to Psalm chapter 50. This is what I've been studying for the last, I think, almost two months now. Maybe a little more than that. It's the book of Psalms. And I'm on 55. It's going to be a long study. In this Psalm, Psalm 50, there's a lot of individual verses that you guys will know, that you may have remembered. Uh, how many cattle does the Lord own? <coughs> That's in this specific psalm. Um, there's some things that I want you to look at and think about this morning. Psalm 50 verse 1 says, The Mighty One, God the Lord, I'm reading from the New King James, The Mighty One, God the Lord, has spoken and called the earth from its rising of the sun to its going down. And I love verse 2. Out of Zion, this is our God. Our God is the perfection of beauty. Have you ever thought of God that way? In this life, we see a lot of beautiful things. There are beautiful people. There are beautiful creatures. Uh, I love white tigers. They are awesome. I like monkeys too, they're awesome. Sometimes they're beautiful, sometimes not. But landscape, mountains, rivers, streams, you can see some beautiful things. But none of these compare to the beauty and the perfection of our God. And sometimes, a lot of times, we never take the time to think of the beauty of God. God is beautiful. And that beauty is why He is love. Isn't that what the Bible says? That God is love? But do you also understand that to have true beauty, you also have to have righteousness and holiness, that those two cannot be separated from true beauty? Aren't you glad that there is at least one place in this universe, one place where there is truth, where there is holiness, where there is perfection, where there is righteousness at all times. We look at this world and what we see is partial truth, hidden truth, twisted truth, ugliness, pain, suffering, sorrow. But there is one place where truth in its beauty and its perfection reigns. Can you imagine living under a government whose foundation is based on purity and holiness and righteousness? We can't imagine that because you've never seen that here on this earth since the fall of Adam. But there is a place in this universe where that kind of government reigns. And you know what? It's going to come here. There will come a day when that will come here, Jesus will establish His kingdom, and that's what His government will be about. The perfection of beauty. It goes on to say, Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. Isn't that beautiful? What about the next couple of lines? How beautiful is that one? Okay? I'm telling you, you cannot divorce God's holiness with His love. You cannot divorce God's righteousness with His love. This is what the world and the churches have done today. They have divorced God's holiness from His love. God has become nothing but a paternal grandfather that will give you everything you want with no repercussions. That is not the God that is the God of the Scriptures. The God of the Scriptures is love. But love is holiness. Do you understand that? Love is righteousness. This is why in the original language of Scripture there is four to five words used for love. We have one. Right? One. And it covers everything. But God, in His love, 
is different from my love. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very, what's that word? Tempestuous. You know what that word means? It's, it's hot, consuming, and very powerful. Do you view your God like this? Or is he a God that can never be wrathful, never be angry? He loves you so much. And brothers and sisters, He does love you so much. But God does not love sin. Amen. God loves the sinner. But God hates sin. Do you understand why? Because sin is what has separated us from Him. And to draw us back to Him, to reconcile us back to Him, it costs the death of His own Son. God hates sin. And his word is very, very plain on that. So, brothers and sisters, as followers of God, he asks you to hate sin just as much. The problem with the church today is we don't hate sin. We hate other people's sin. But we don't hate our own. We can see other people's sin, but we don't see our own. And we put sin in categories. We have sin that's not really bad sin. And then there's other sin that's really bad sin. Is that right? But to God, sin is what? Sin. That's right. And you realize this? Do you realize that that's why God said that the wages of singular. Singular. Sin, singular. Not the wages of sins. The wages of sin is death. How many, sin did, how many sins did Adam and Eve commit before they were cast out of the garden? That's the holiness and the perfection of your God. You and not ever lose sight of that. If you think you're good and you're holding on to one sin and you're cherishing that, God is a tempestuous fire that will devour everything unclean in His sight. When Jesus comes, what group of people will you be in? The ones that say, lo, this is our God. He has come for us. He will save us. Or will you be part of those who say to the rocks and the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. That choice is yours. How do you know which people you're going to be? The Bible says, by your fruits, you will be known. So the question and the answer is, by your fruit, that will determine which people you will be. Will you be sheep or will you be goats? I've said this over and over and over again, that the worst words and the worst position you will ever find yourself in is if you thought throughout your life you're going to be saved. And you get to that day of judgment and you find out you're hanging out with the goats. And the sheep are in a totally different line. And at that point, there's no more time for you. Your choice has been made. When Jesus comes, if we happen to be that generation that is alive to see Him, do you know the terror that is going to be on the people's face who ask, what would you rather have? Would you rather be burnt by his fire or have rocks crush you to death? They want rocks to crush them to death. Because they're not afraid of the fire, they're afraid of the wrath of the Lamb. Okay? It's better for a rock to come down and crush me than it is to face Jesus face to face and not have him living in Brothers and sisters, today is the day you need to decide what kind of people you're going to be. The General Conference for the last two years has been promoting what? Revival. Two things. What is it? Revival. Revival, and what's the other one? That goes with revival. Reformation, right? Revival and reformation. The Spirit of Prophecy tells us that a great work of revival will happen right before Jesus comes. 
And so the general conference is wanting revival to come so Jesus can come. I asked this in my Sabbath school class. Revival, does it start on the corporate level or does it start on the individual level? And so revival will never happen in a church until God's individual people are revived and reformed. And that will not happen until you go to God and seek revival and reformation in your own lives. Week after week after week, we stand up here before you. We preach, we teach, we pray, we sing. And there's only one thing that we want, and that is revival and reformation. That when you leave these doors, you leave here changed so that on Sunday, you're a child of Christ all the way through Friday. So that when you come back here on Saturday, this isn't the best day that you act. This isn't the best face that you put on. That's hypocrisy. You realize that, right? Does this church need revival? Amen. Yes. yes, I will tell you yes. As your pastor, I will tell you, you and myself, we need revival. We need to be woken up. We need to see what our true spiritual state is. If you were to look at it from God's perspective, and we are the last church, what is that church called? The church of who? And what's the problem with the Laodiceans? They are, they think they're rich, when actually they're poor, they think they're clothed very well and are beautiful, when actually they are blind and poor and naked, and here's another word for you, wretched. Is that how you want God to view you as being wretched? How do you know, you know that the word uh, Laodicea has two meanings? <coughs> it's the sleeping church, but it's also the church that overcomes. You guys know that? There's not, a, there's not another church, right? So the church of Laodicea is a church that Jesus comes back for, but he doesn't come back for them in their Laodicean state. They are the church that overcomes. How do they overcome? Revival. By the word of their testimony yes. and by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> so, brothers and sisters, for two years the conference has, won, has been asking for a calling for revival. They've been asking their preachers, their administration, their teachers <coughs> to teach and preach and talk revival. Talking will do nothing if you do not change your hearts. Talking will accomplish nothing if you do not see your true condition. What is your walk with God like? Does it only work one day out of the week? Or are you a Christian seven days out of the week? And that's what God is wanting. And that's what this psalm deals with. Psalm chapter 50. Our God shall come. What are we looking forward to? What are we waiting for? What is our great hope? Man, don't, don't get quiet with me now. I know what it is. What is it? Is that not what we're here for? Is that not the very purpose of this church? To preach the soon coming of Jesus Christ? See, that answer and that weakness of that answer is the cause of concern that I have as your pastor. With do you really want Jesus to come? No. The only reason why this church was raised up, and the only reason why there are Adventists walking the face of this earth, is to proclaim a specific message, and that is Christ is coming soon. Be ye prepared. But we are the church of Laodicea. We are, have fallen asleep. We think we're good, when actually we're not. We think we're prosperous. When actually, he looks at us and sometimes he sees our wretchedness. Christ has to live in us, with us, and through us to show the world that he is. Is Jesus going to change this world? Is he going to come back and change it? And the answer is no. Who is the body of Christ here today? <coughs> you are. You're his hands. You're his feet. You're his mouth. You are Jesus Christ to the world. 
And however the world sees you and your Christianity is what they think of your Christ. And I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people who don't have a, 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 a high regard for Jesus Christ. Not because he's done anything wrong, but because of the way we portray him. Do you realize that Gandhi said, I love your Christ. I just don't like your Christians because they're so much not like your Christ. That's so true. That is us today. Ricky, what is Jesus waiting to come back for? For his bride, for his people. To make his bride, ready. right? To make himself ready. But you realize you can't make yourself ready without Christ doing it for you. Yeah. And you realize you can't do that if Christ doesn't live in you. And what that comes down to is whether you will submit fully and completely to him. Do you know what the difference between the first century church and our church is today? Anybody? You're not being murdered. <laughs> Here she said we're not being murdered. That is one of the, the differences. And that's why we're not as strong as they were. There's one where Gary, what is it? Oh. Or what do you think? Well, I think there is a lot of supernatural miracle, miraculous things taking place in the early church. It really got the people's true. attention. <clears throat> got their attention. But do miracles change the heart? No. no. The devil can perform miracles, and he doesn't lead to salvation, can he? Right? Okay? The Bible tells you that before Jesus comes, the devil is going to personate Christ himself. That's the greatest miracle, deceptive miracle that the world will ever see. Miracles happen all the time. They don't change your heart. The difference between that church and our church is this one word called submission. They were sold out to Jesus Christ and they were willing to die for Him. We speak of dying for Him, but we don't really do it. Right? Because when things get hard, if it affects my job or my livelihood, I will change. If I don't look popular and you know I'm not with my group, then I will change how I act. If it's uncomfortable to speak truth, then I will be quiet. That's the difference between their church and ours. It's called submission. And that is the weakness in our church today, in this church here. Not the church, this church. Is your submission to Jesus Christ on a daily basis. It's my weakness as well. It's why God has not come back for his bride. The conference wants revival and reformation. It starts on an individual basis. It starts with me. I'm going to start with you. And it will move out. Listen, if people see, here's another difference between their church and ours, is when the pagans saw Christians, they saw something different. Go into a church and tell me what difference you see between pagans on the outside and Christians on the inside. That's why I'm in the Adventist church, because you go to an Adventist church, sometimes you can see. Okay? We dress the same. We entertain ourselves the same way. We talk the same. In that day, there was a vast difference. You know what the vast difference was? They understood the love of Jesus Christ, and they showed it to their enemies. We hate our enemies. And if you're in my church and you're my enemy, I really hate you. That causes laughs, but think about it. If you're conservative and I'm liberal, how much do you like me? If I'm liberal and you're conservative, how much do I like you? You, have you allowed your politics to blind your true view of what Jesus has called you for? Have you allowed your own prejudices against people because they may not be the same as you, the same color, from the same country, speak the same language, or from the same culture? Have you allowed that to separate you from who Christ has called you to save and love? I didn't come here to preach smooth things to you this morning, brothers and sisters. I hope you wear steel toed shoes. But there's a reason why Jesus hasn't come, and there's a reason why this church isn't as on fire as it should be. It is because there are problems here. And there are problems that you better address before you breathe your last, or you will stand before God and answer for them. 
Jesus calls us to love. He didn't put <coughs> asterisks behind that word love. He didn't say love only if you are politically of the same mind, if your skin is the same color, if your culture is the same. He told you to love your enemies. If you're supposed to love your enemies and do good to them, then what should you be doing to your own brothers and sisters who proclaim Christ? Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. He shall come to the heavens from above, and to, or he shall call to the heavens from above, and to the earth, that he may do what? <coughs> Judge. And then what's for it after that? His. His. He's not talking about judging the earth. He's not talking about all those sinners that are out there. He's talking about coming and judging you and me. For Peter says, judgment begins where? At the house of God. Have we forgotten that? God has called us to live differently than the world lives. God has called us to love radically. And to love without prejudice. God has called us to such a higher standard that the world will never, ever meet. Why? Because you have to have Jesus living in your heart to meet that standard. And if Jesus is living in your heart, you cannot do anything but live out that standard. Did Christ come so you can stay in your sin? Did Christ come so that you can continue to hate other people? Did Christ come so that you can divide your church because of your political views? Christ came so that you could rise above all of that and show the world that Jesus is alive and that Jesus is God and that Jesus is our only hope. But the world sees Christians as people that either are hypocrites or they don't love. They split the family. I like that. And that's true. God says that He will come, and He will come for the sole purpose of judging His people. Are you prepared for that kind of judgment? There's nothing you can do. There's no good actions you can take to say to God, I'm ready. Judge me. The only thing you can do is have Jesus Christ in your heart. Because brothers and sisters, it only took one sin for Adam and Eve to fall. And sin to infect the entire race. It will only take one sin that you're holding on to to separate you and let you stand in front of God without Christ as your Savior. I talked about this today in my Sabbath school class. You realize that the closer you come to Jesus Christ, the clearer you see His perfection. The clearer you see Jesus' perfection, the more you see your imperfection. The more you see your imperfection drives you right back to Jesus Christ because you need His perfection. And so you look at your life and you see how you're acting away from church. And the words that come out of your mouth, the words that come out of my mouth, are they glorifying Him? Or are they hurting people? And I realized that there are times when they hurt people. And the world looks at that and says, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not bad. That's not a sin. But the closer you come to Christ and you see His perfection, you realize your imperfection. And brothers and sisters, do you realize that Jesus said, if you have hate in your heart, it's the same as murdering your brother. If you speak angry words about or against your brother, it's the same as killing him. That will separate you from God. Do you realize that gossip, Paul puts that right in the list of the big bad sins. Do you know why? We look at gossip and think, eh, there's nothing wrong with that. Or we use the church as a way to gossip. Well, I'm only telling you this because... You know, and in the end, we're doing it because we're wanting to either hurt that person 
or speak bad about that person. Either way, it's gossip. And gossip is one of those sins in the church that is acceptable. But it's not acceptable. Turn with me back to Psalm 50. Gather my saints together. This is verse 5. Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare His righteousness, for God Himself is what? Okay? Verse 4. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that He may judge His people. Gather my saints together to me, God says, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Let the heavens declare His righteousness, for God Himself is judge. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify for you. Was this written only for the people at that time? Was it written only for the nation of Israel? Does it have applications for God's people today? Put in there, instead of Israel, put in their church. Hear, O oh my people, and I will speak. O oh church, and I will testify against you. I am God, your God. I will not rebuke you for your sacrifices or your burnt offerings, which are continually before me. I will not take a bull from your house or goats out of your folds. Why? Does God need your bulls or your goats? Does God need your money? Does he need your car? Does he need your talents? The answer is no. What does the next verse say? Read it, Ricky. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. There you go. That's where you get that phrase, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Okay? It's all his. But God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be friends with you. He wants to love you. But you better understand that to have this relationship, you are approaching a holy and righteous and pure God. And God expects you to follow Him in holiness, in righteousness. And I say the word perfection. How can we as sinners do that? Say it loudly. In that is your only hope and the only answer to that question. Now do you understand why it's so important to submit to Jesus Christ every day? You cannot live a sinful life and expect Christ to bless you. You cannot live a sinful life and call upon His name and expect Him to save you. God does not work that way. God did not call you out of the pig pen. He did not call you out of the slop of sin put you right back there. Is that right? When the prodigal son came to his senses, where was he at? In the pig pen, with the slop on him. And when he got out, did he shower and change his clothes? He went right home to his father. When he came to his father, what was he wearing? The same slop that he left the pig pen with. He had the whole speech that he was going to tell his father that he would be a slave in his house rather than his son. But what did his father give him? Gave him a ring and a robe. The robe wasn't to cover the slob. The robe was to make him into a new creation. The old has passed away. You are no longer the kid from a pig pen. You are now my son.